10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, episode 219. Hey everybody, welcome back into episode 219 of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast. Hope all of you had a great week out there and are ready to jump into part three of our series on fourths. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Now before we jump into the show, I just wanted to thank some brand new patrons of the podcast. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we do have a Patreon site where it costs $3 a month to support the show and get all of the PDFs uh, to every single episode that we have ever done. So the people I want to thank this week, I want to thank Andrew, Sean, and I also want to thank David for editing his pledge up to $5. A lot of people have been editing their pledges above and beyond the $3, and that really means a lot to me. Um, That shows me that you're getting value out of what we're providing you. So thank you to all those people. If you would like to join up, simply go to 10minutejazzlesson.com, click on one of the Patreon banners, get yourself signed up to support the show today. Also, if you like our theme music, as you can hear, it's brand new. That is a brand new album that I have put out with one of my favorite pianists on the planet, Mike Effenberger. And we've got some great jazz standards for you, including one original composition by myself. And you can grab that album called Two Ets by, again, visiting our website, 10minutejazzlesson.com. Clicking on the first link on the sidebar, you will see the album cover, and that will bring you over to purchase that record. And I'm really excited about this. As I said last week, you know, I do so much educational work that it's really nice to be putting some music out into the world. So I I hope you enjoy that record and some of the tunes that we recorded. All right, let's jump into this week's episode. So this week, we're going to take the fourths that we've been working on. and We're going to actually put them into some context, which is the really fun part about working on this stuff. So this week we're going to look at some 2-5-1 progressions uh, using the fourths that we had worked on. And then next week we're going to do our tune of the month episode where we actually, you know, put some of this stuff into action over a full chord progression. But for this week, let's just look at the 2-5-1 and explore some ways that we can turn the exercises into uh, some real life stuff. Now, before we begin, I want to sort of mention that this is like a very specific sound that we're looking at. And I want to talk about some of the advantages that we get from using fourths, and then we'll look at them in action. So one of the cool things that I really appreciate about fourths is that it's sort of just beyond the interval distance that we're comfortable with generally. So generally, you know, we use half steps, whole steps, and then we sort of move into the territory of thirds in our playing when we get a little bit more comfortable and we have a little bit more range on our instruments and we feel we feel better about jumping around a little bit. But I find after teaching for a long time, students of all skill levels, that when we get to the interval of a fourth, people start to get a little bit more uncomfortable and they can't use that wide of an interval in their playing. And in my opinion, one of the coolest ways to get better at music is to start using wider intervals. So that's the first thing I notice. And I think that might be one of the first things that you notice when you listen to these lines and you start practicing them is they force you to jump around your instrument a little bit more, which I think is going to be great for all of you. It's going to force you outside of your comfort zone a little bit and get that wider interval playing. And that'll start to transfer over to your solo. You'll start to notice that you have more options because you feel comfortable jumping around the instrument a little bit more. And we all have heard our favorite musicians do that a lot. And I don't know about you, but I think that's one of the most striking sounds in music when somebody's using those large intervals. Okay, so we've worked on these couple of exercises. And what you're going to find is that even just working on couple of exercises in one key only is really going to make you 
much more comfortable with this interval of a fourth. And I think what you're going to find, most of you, is that you don't have to methodically go through each and every key and practice these exercises. I think that the sound of a fourth and the feeling of a fourth is going to transfer over to some new keys that you haven't necessarily practiced the exercises in. And I think you might find that out today when you start working on these over the 2-5-1 progression. You might find, well, this is not exactly what Nick gave me, you know, over the last two weeks, but I actually, I could play this stuff pretty well. So this is less of an exercise of you must put this in all 12 keys and more of an exercise of just being able to conceptualize and hear the interval of a perfect fourth and a tritone because those are the two intervals that we're dealing with um, in all of these episodes. So I just wanted to mention that don't feel the pressure to put this stuff in every single key right now. If you want to do that, you certainly can, but I'm just saying that I don't think it's absolutely crucial in the way that some of the other stuff that I've given you, I've expressly told you, all right, practice this in all 12 keys. All right, let's jump into some of the lines here. So let's start with the first line. We'll go over it, we'll hear it, all that good stuff. So this is just a plain old 251 in the key of C. But what you're going to notice is that on the one chord, I do use that Lydian sound because those are the exercises that we went over. Whenever we did fourth exercises over a major chord, we made it into a Lydian major with that sharp 11. Now, we have not done anything over a dominant chord yet, but here's the thing. Remember that a D minor 7 chord and a G 7th chord are the same key. They're two modes of C major. So really, we can just use the same stuff that we did over D minor 7 to play over that G7 chord while taking into account the progression and where we want to resolve it and all that kind of stuff. So let's hear it first, and then we'll break it down a little bit. Here's example number one on your PDF. <laughs> So you could hear it's pretty angular. It's doing a lot of different things. So let's just talk about it in depth a little bit. So I'm starting with my stacked fourths. I'm jumping up, I'm playing four fourths right on top of each other, D, G, C to F. Then I'm coming down to E, playing a fourth down to A, jumping up to B, playing a fourth up to E. So there's my two chord, all fourths. And I'm going to try to keep it that way. I'm going to try to keep it pretty much all fourths the entire time. Now over the dominant chord, I am just playing descending fourths. So D to A, C to G, B to F. Now I break that pattern. I go right down to an E. Then I jump up a fourth. And then from the A, I'm going to resolve to the G over the C, C major 7 sharp 11. And in this, I'm kind of doing the up-down thing, but I'm jumping around a little bit. So I play G to C, F sharp to C, D, G, E, A. Again, just all fourths. But it's the direction that I'm going that I think keeps it a little bit more interesting, kind of keeping you guessing. So let's just hear that one more time. <laughs> I really, really love that sound, you know, and when I put that into my playing, I think it just makes the line so much more interesting, especially if I'm playing in like a really heavily bebop oriented style. Um, once I start playing these fourths and things become a little bit more angular and I'm doing the sharp 11 sound, the Lydian sound, I feel like it's a great break um, or a great sort of difference between what I was doing and then I'm throwing something in there that's hopefully keeping your interest up. And I think that's where the, the advantage to these lines lies a lot of the time. So in this next one, what I'm really banking on is the rhythm, right? So the fourths are there. I'm going to have you figure out where the fourths are. But what you're going to notice is I've really thought about placing some eighth note rests in places that I think sound cool so that the line all of a sudden becomes syncopated. If you look at the first example, 
it's just straight eighth notes. If you look at this example, now you'll notice that I have a lot of rests and things are just becoming a lot more interesting rhythmically. And I think that's the thing that really makes this line work. So let me play it for you a couple of times. And then what I'm gonna have you do is analyze where all the fourths occur. They're gonna be really easy to spot. Again, it's, it's pretty much all fourths, but I also want you to analyze where I put the rests and what I'm trying to do rhythmically to make this a little bit more interesting. So here's the second line. So hopefully that gives you something to think about in terms of rhythm. Now I'm gonna move on to a minor two, five, one. So now we've got a half diminished chord as our two chord, and then we've got a flat nine chord as our five chord, and then finally we're gonna resolve to a minor seventh chord. So D minor seven flat five to G seven flat nine to C minor seven is gonna be our third two five one. And in this one, I, this really illustrates the fact that hopefully you can play this stuff pretty well without having practiced it before. Because remember, the intervals always stay the same. It's always either a perfect fourth or a tritone. Those are the only two intervals that we're dealing with within these lines. So I think that you'll be able to pick up on this stuff pretty easily uh, without necessarily having practiced it before. And that's what I would like you to do. I'd like you to try this stuff just right off the bat, see how well you're doing it. Now, if you're really struggling, okay, go back and practice some of this stuff. But if you really know your fourths, you should be able to play either a perfect fourth or a tritone from any note and find some success. So you'll notice in the first measure, I'm doing my stacked fourths just up and down. In the second measure, I'm doing the exact same thing, but I'm fitting it to that G7 flat nine chord where I'm just playing my stacked fourths up and down the instrument and then I'm doing the exact same thing over the C minor seven chord, stacked fourths up and down. And this gives this a really interesting sound because what I'm doing is in essence, I'm playing basically the same thing over every chord, but the notes are changing because I have to adapt them to a new chord symbol. So let's check out what this one sounds like. You go through, you analyze it, you figure out where the perfect fourths are, and where the tritones are, and see if you like the sound of these stacked fourths sort of morphing to fit the new chord that's happening each measure. <laughs> All right, so those are our three licks for you this week. This will get you out of exercise land and into a little bit more of real life application. But next week is really gonna be the one where we actually see this stuff in action over a tune. So I really look forward to writing that etude for you. And I hope I see you back here next week. Hope you all are doing well out there. Remember, if you'd like to sign up for Patreon, you can find that by going to 10minutejazzlesson.com, clicking on one of the Patreon links, get yourself signed up today. And you can also grab our brand new album called Two Ets. Again, that is a duo tenor saxophone piano record with myself and the fantastic Mike Effenberger on piano. And you can find that at 10minutejazzlesson.com. Right on the sidebar, you will see the album cover. You can click that, go over and purchase it. All right, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hope you have a great weekend. Hope you're staying safe and healthy. And we'll talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye.